Good afternoon. Today on the final bar, a little update, nice upside follow through with lots of individual stocks either testing or breaking through significant resistance levels. We're going to take a look at a lot of those in a shifting stock segment where we'll reflect on price movements. Also, a lot of companies either coming out of earnings last week or entering this week. Also, my guest, Tom Boley, longtime stock charts contributor. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to today, today's edition of The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com, coming at you from a somewhat rainy Seattle, Washington. Good to be with you today. And thanks, everyone, for being with us uh, these first couple of weeks as we get started with The Final Bar. Really enjoy sort of breaking down the day's price action and, uh, and relating it to the long-term trends. Uh, as always, please keep your questions coming. Really appreciate the interactive nature of the show. So uh, hit us up at The Final Bar at StockCharts.com. Anytime you can, uh, you know, heavy earnings weeks, so we're going to be getting to uh, a lot of those themes and a lot of movements in a little bit, but I did want to highlight very quickly, I'll be speaking at the Traders Expo in Las Vegas. That's coming up November 7th through 9th of this year. Uh, I'll be speaking on Friday evening, doing a session called the five modes of mindful investors, sort of talking about how you internalize behavioral biases and how to look past them or sort of, you know, uh, routine your way out of those. Uh, if you're interested, you can register at stockcharts.lasvegastradersexpo.com. I look forward to seeing you and uh, meeting up with we, with many of you there. And if you do come, please make a point of uh, coming up and saying hello, because it'd be great to uh, to connect with all of you. So with today, obviously, we're in a heavy earnings period. We've got a lot of themes going on out there. And again, the point of this show is to focus on the price action, focus on the truth of the markets. One of my former colleagues used to say the charts are the truth serum for the markets. So forget about what could happen, what may happen, what might happen, uh, and focus on what is happening. And the best way to measure that is in the form of price itself, right? That's the measure of supply and demand, of fear and greed, and all the emotions that drive uh, asset prices. So, you know, looking at a chart of the S&P 500, closing back above 3,000 on the S&P 500, first time uh, in, uh, in quite a bit since, uh, since mid-September. Uh, so, so quite a significant turnaround, sort of, uh, you know, round tripping from uh, the sell-off there going into the, the beginning of October and sort of reversing. Friday, we had a, more of a distribution day, felt weaker rather than stronger with Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all sort of stalling. But today we get the upside follow through. And again, a lot of earnings releases, a lot of uh, stocks breaking out, including, you know, names and transports and some, some really, and, and, and also financials, which we're going to look at in a little bit. So a lot of really interesting themes kind of coming out from a technical perspective we'll, uh, we'll keep teasing out. So again, on, on the big picture, right, how does this fit into the long-term trend? So again, we've talked about this supply area, this congestion area from around 3,000 to 3030. This is where the tops from the end of July and the beginning of September all played out. We're right back into that range where if we are going to top out as a market, we're right at that point where we would start doing so. Now, the question now is, you know, do we have enough momentum with the individual names, with all of the themes that we've talked about for the last couple of weeks? Do enough of those sort of break to new highs, sort of have the momentum to push through? And, and that's, the, that's the question. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. A lot of things like the XLF right at key resistance levels, and we're very close with Something like the XLF sort of indicating that we've uh, that we've broken out, but it totally depends. Let's look at a chart of the XLF real quick, and then we'll go back to some of the uh, some of the movements. So you know, this is a chart we've looked at a number of times. It's been one of the three and three a couple times already. This is the XLF, so it's weighted to the largest name, some of the big banks, but you know, a good measure of overall financial sector performance. Here we have a much sort of cleaner read on the peak in July, a very similar peak in September, and now we're right at that. Same level, not quite a new closing high, but very, very close for this point um, in the cycle. So, you know, again, whether or not we're able to sort of follow through, I, I would say this week we either have a, accomplished the resistance level and we start to, you know, distribute again. And this tells us that we're in more of that sideways market or names like JP Morgan, which have already broken out, names like Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, other names that have had earnings that, you know, if they, they can continue to push higher and sort of break this out, that would be a very different environment than the sideways environment we've had in the XLF for the last 
four to five months. So some really interesting, uh, you know, key points that we're at, I would say, with stocks overall. Let's unpack a little more of the price action today. So we had the NASDAQ up the most out of sort of our main uh, major market indexes. Looking down at the, at the rest of them, the transport's up 1.4%, so really leading the way higher. You get some of the railroad names in there, uh, airlines, others all of a sudden starting to, to brighten up very, very nicely. Second, actually, right below transports were Russell 2000, small cap stocks, right, 0.94. Um, down at the bottom, we have mid caps lagging behind uh, the S&P, also Dow Utilities. So, so certainly more of a switch on you know, more offense than defense today. That's certainly the case. Looking at the sectors, we have energy up the most. I mean, this is, it is definitely a different uh, feel than we've had. This is the XLE, just looking at the last year. Um, you can see this, uh, this rally off the 57 level, which is where we closed on Friday. Last week was you know, really sort of negative, more distributive for, um, for energy as we sort of rolled over. And it felt like you know, maybe we found resistance at the 50-day, now breaking back down. Now, all of a sudden, we we're reversing back up. So you know, the XLE's ability to eclipse that 50-day eclipse the previous highs from last week would certainly indicate more of a shift. Not quite there yet, but, but interesting to see if that uh, theme continues to play out during the course of the week. And then second behind energy is financials. We're going to look at some of the, the bank stocks here in a bit. And then technology. So, you know, the, this sort of pattern is what you'd expect if the market's sort of in, on offense, right? Sort of uh, stepping on the gas, moving higher. The things that should be working are working on a sector level. At the bottom, we have staples, we have healthcare and materials. Very interesting, both the consumer uh, groups down here at the bottom. So the XLY, not much more gain than, uh, than staple. So usually you'd expect that more at the top of the range if, uh, if, it's, a, if it's a big leader. Looking at the industry themes, just a couple things to pick out. We talked about semiconductors a number of times. That was the, one of the three on three on Friday, if I remember right. The relative performance of semiconductors, you know, once again, started, started having a nice day. Not new relative highs yet, but sort of turning back uh, positive. And again, when semiconductors are outperforming, that tends to be a positive for the overall market environment. At the bottom, we have gold. We have healthcare products, two lagging uh, groups compared to, uh, compared to the rest of it. Um, we're going to look very quickly here at the relative rotation graph, thinking of uh, thinking of stocks and, and in this case sectors. So, you know, we've talked for a while about sort of this shifting pattern of of the defense being on the right, sort of outperforming some of the traditional offense doing worse. But look at what's happened on the last couple of weeks, where real estate, where utilities again on a long term relative basis, sort of rolling over. The XLP consumer staples down into the weakening quadrant now, um, and then you have technology, you have consumer discretionary kind of hooking back. Higher and again, the most I guess uh, you know interesting or most compelling patterns I've seen on the RRG using this for a number of years is when something goes down into the weakening quadrant, hooks back up, aims to the upper right. So if these can continue doing so, XLK is sort of tipping back to the left, but if can go back to the upper right, all that means is that it's outperforming and the momentum's increasing, and that tends to be pretty positive. Here's XLE, which has certainly been the outlier, way on the left side, far underperforming, but you see how the angle keeps improving and improving. So. If this can keep accelerating up and to the right, that tells you that energy as a, as a group over the longer term starting to improve. And that's a, that's a theme certainly we'd want to want to keep following in on. So a lot of really interesting, uh, interesting movements here when we look at today's price action. I would say surprising how we've had sort of this upside follow through, given all the caution that we've seen on a lot of the charts in the last couple of weeks. This next segment, we're going to do uh, shifting stocks. You know, we talked about just the environment, uh, heavy earnings week this week after last week, which same thing, and a lot of big names with a lot of market cap reporting, and that always creates um, some interesting themes that we want to be aware of. So uh, I wanted to just spend some time looking at some individual names and thinking about what's working, what isn't working, and and uh, and and what sort of breakouts and breakouts uh, breakdowns I think you should be familiar with. We talked about J.P. Morgan uh, a little earlier. And, uh, you know, I, I run a research uh, firm called Sierra Alpha Research, which I've run for a number of years, working mostly with financial advisors and some institutions. And uh, in a year and a half, two years ago, something like that, I came up with this idea of uh, um, uh, three stocks that were sort of the bellwether group. I called them the SAR bellwether group. And it was JP Morgan, Alphabet, uh, and Visa. And we'll look very quickly at the three of those. You know, JP Morgan, this is a chart that had been sort of chart challenged. It's sort of broken out in April and then really just sideways on a relative basis, sort of flat to down. Um, and then all of a sudden in the last, you know, six weeks, we get sort of this rotation coming off of the 200-day moving average, come back and retesting the 50-day, now breaking to new price highs, gapping up again today with an up close, now in an uptrend above 
to upward sloping moving averages, that's sort of what we'd want. If you had a portfolio that looked like this, you'd have to feel pretty good about that, uh, you know, all else being equal. And also, I like the new relative high. So, you know, JP Morgan, this type of stock has emerged from sort of a yawn or something that's sort of an afterthought into something that's really emerged as a strong, uh, strong name. What's interesting with something like JP Morgan is that it's entered the overbought region, which again, all that means is that it's gone up a lot. And that's kind of what we would want. So you can see back here in April, it gapped up, became overbought. But you know, I had another couple of weeks of further upside as, as things continued to go. All it's telling you is based on how it normally trades, it's gone up a lot more than it usually does. And that seems about right looking at the price chart. So in, interesting, something to monitor, right? Because a lot of times it'll become overbought and that'll be a short term pullback. So we'll have to see if we see a similar pattern here. But overall, you know, again, just in, in a vacuum, that's a pretty attractive, pretty attractive chart. We're going to look at the two other names that I sort of mentioned in that bellwether group just to see how they're all going. So this is Alphabet. So, you know, when you see something like the bank, something like JP Morgan looks really positive. Alphabet, not nearly as attractive, right? We can see the more of the flatter price profile, the flatter relative profile, you know, certainly stands out where it really hasn't gone anywhere in the last three months, right? Relative to the S&P 500 after the jump up here in, uh, in, in July, sort of that gap. Um, nowhere near the the previous high. Still need has a little bit more to go. Not over overbought yet. So you know, okay, but but not looking as attractive. But still holding up just fine. Here's Visa though, and the funniest thing is when I originally created that bellwether group, Visa was like clearly the strongest. This is the one that just kept outperforming, long and strong up and to the right, strong relative performer, strong price performer. But out of the three, arguably this is the least attractive out of the three, with with more of a distributed pattern, a clear lower high. Um, you know, sort of stalling at the 50 day moving average. Again, not bad. None of these charts look bad. It's just, you know, the one JP Morgan all of a sudden looks the most, uh, looks most attractive. So the reason why I think of a bellwether group like that is I always like to keep track of them as a, as a threesome. How do those three charts look? If overall they look better than, uh, than weaker, then, you know, overall you have to feel pretty good about the overall market environment. Let's whip through some other uh, other charts that I think are interesting. Uh, Key reported last week. This is a, a regional bank, obviously, and uh, you know, interesting how this again has sort of reversed. This felt very double toppy, where you had the peak in July, peak in September. You know, consistent resistance level on a price basis. We've got a year of uh, of essentially being sideways on a relative basis. Not much to get excited about. Uh, and then all of a sudden we've uh, we've established a clear higher low here, rebounding off the 200-day moving average. Once again, testing uh, the high. So you know that chart of the XLP. I think it's charts like KeyCorp, right? JP Morgan has already eclipsed the previous resistance levels. A lot of charts like Key have not quite done it yet. So you know, looking back months from now, you will either say, "Wow, this was a the ultimate top level," or "Wow, this is a big base before a, a huge breakout." And I think how charts like Key play out over the next week, the next two, three weeks, I think will be really, really telling as to whether we have a, a nice strong tape into year end or uh, whether it's more cautionary. So a really interesting chart to keep, uh, to keep aware of there. I was talking with Tom Boley before we started about some of the transports and, uh, and the rail, this railroad was one I wanted to, to highlight, UNP. So a lot of the railroads up heavily today, um, you know, some nice earnings wins coming out of the, the group. But, you know, this is a chart that again had been, you know, Two weeks ago, all of a sudden looked horrible, breaking to new swing lows, breaking below the August low, closing down. It felt very negative. You felt the 50-day moving average sloping downwards. It felt very heavy, especially with other stocks that were holding up okay. Look at how this is now reversed, established more of a higher low, now back above the 50 and 200-day moving averages. So, you know, a nice up move with a lot of stocks uh, today and, and UNP, maybe another good, good example of that. Let's look at the scooter reports just to see what sort of names appear here. I always like to start with the top 10 uh, stocks in the large cap space, if only as a reminder that regardless of how noisy about how volatile the markets are, there are always a handful of names that are just in consistent positive uptrends. And it is worth remembering that. So you can either look on your members dashboard or just do a quick screen for scooters above like 90, 95. That'll be the top 5, 10% of uh, large cap US stocks. And you will see charts like Target, which again, have just been consistent, strong performers, and, you know, nice gap up from Target in, uh, in August. But at this point, Target's the number one stock on our proprietary ranking system, making new relative highs again over the last week, which is pretty, pretty uh, compelling. Uh, NWL, New Old Brands, is in uh, consumer discretionary. We've talked about this chart recently. And again, a nice uh, follow through day again today. So this is a real classic reversal from distribution to consolidation sideways to more accumulation, higher highs and higher lows. And look at just the, the consistent upside follow through there. 
I'll highlight maybe one other name, KSU, another, uh, another um, railroad popping up on there. Uh, here's another one, CarMax. So again, we have plenty of stocks that are breaking to new highs that are in really attractive configurations. And to be honest with you, I think that's sort of the strength of something like the scooter rankings. It allows you to very quickly focus on charts that are interesting charts. If you want to find charts that are just consistently strong, look at the at the top ranked names and you'll find them. Let's look very quickly to just to wrap up this segment at some of the, the charts on the move. So these are the most up today. Uh, and we will find uh, Cody, right? C-O-T-Y. This is a, a Staples name, personal products. Uh, you know, nice gap up higher on earnings, nice break above resistance. So again, anytime you see something like this, I always want to look for a follow through. So tomorrow is really telling you've had the update, you've sort of had the gains, you close toward the high, that's all good. I want to know what, what happens next. Once people have now established that this has occurred, do we, we think there's more staying power? So I think next day, the rest of this week is really important on a chart like that to see if we have some, uh, some follow through. Uh, State Streets, there's some others in, uh, in the financial sector doing really well. This is STT, which is more of the, you know, the asset management side of the financials, but nice uh, break above the 200 day moving average on Friday and another follow through day today. And on charts like this, you want to watch the RSI, it's uh, almost 75. If it gets above 80, that tends to be a really good long term uh, signal just tells you that the momentum overall really, really strong. Citigroup, another one we've talked about some of the banks. So you can see how Citigroup, Key, some of these ones, you know, really setting up. I think it, you have to see if they break through resistance or if they stall. So Morgan Stanley, another one in that same bucket. Also, you know, it's interesting. It's been a stretch where I would not think of airlines as being sort of the juice, but ALK, Alaska Airlines, jumping up really nicely today, just reaching the overbought range, but breaking, breaking above resistance. This resistance goes all the way back to last February. Nice basing pattern. And in general, that tends to be the type of chart you want to own, not the type of thing that you want to underweight. And then just very quickly, spend some time looking at the ones on the right side. These are the ones that are most down. And something like CME comes to mind as, you know, all these charts that are breaking out, testing resistance, looking interesting. Now you see why this, even though it's not horrible, it looks so much worse on a relative basis. So you can see that the relative strength turning lower, lower high, breaking down through the 50 day, not the type of chart I would probably want to own in this environment, given so many other names um, that look so uh, that look so positive. And again, in consumer staples, I'm concerned by charts like uh, Mondelez, which, you know, again, testing support, testing a lower level if it breaks through something like 53 uh, you look at the 200-day and concern about potential further lows. So there are a lot of really interesting individual charts. Again, we just scratched the surface using the scooter rankings and some of the earnings releases. I'd encourage you to spend some time there and uh, and see what you can uh, see what you can find. We're going to take a brief commercial break. We'll be back with my guest Tom Bowley. See you in a minute. Today's market volatility provides savvy traders and active investors with an abundance of profitable opportunities. At the Traders Expo Las Vegas, November 7th through 9th, over 75 of the most respected traders in the world, including Dennis Gartman, Tom Sosnoff, Todd Gordon, and Tom DeMarc, will explain how they're adapting their strategies and share the specific trading opportunities they've identified in equities, options, forex, futures, cryptocurrencies, and more. Claim your free pass to join them at TradersExpo.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is your host, Dave Keller, here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks so much for joining us today and, uh, and every day to unwrap today's price action. I want to bring on a familiar face, familiar voice to many of you, a longtime Stock Charts contributor and a friend, Tom Boley. Tom, thanks for joining today. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, Dave. It's uh, awesome to be here. Always enjoyed coming on uh, Market Watchers Live with you um, and excited to watch uh, your new show, uh, Trading Places with Tom Bowley and seeing, seeing how you're doing it. And you took, uh, took some time to send us uh, five charts ahead of time, which I'm really interested to, uh, to see how you lay this out. Can, you, can we get going with the first one? This is uh, sort of a long-term secular bull bear cycle look. Yeah, I'm a real short-term trader, so I thought I'd bring up a 100-year <laughs> monthly <show. laughs> Perfect. On the S&P 500. Actually, I just wanted to go through uh, and explain the market goes through these generational type cycles. And that's all I was pointing out here on this chart is that, you know, you go back into the 1930s and 40s, we had a secular bear market. Then for two decades in the 50s and 60s, a secular bull market. 
Then again, we went through the 70s into early 80s, another secular bear, huge two decade run in the 80s and 90s, secular bull. And then from uh, 2000 through about 2012, again, a secular bear sideways consolidating. I believe in 2013, when we broke out, we entered a secular bull market. I think that uh, it doesn't mean you're not going to come down. It doesn't even mean we're not going to have recessions. Uh, if you look back in history, the 1950s, 1960s, the 1980s, 1990s, during those secular bull markets, we had multiple recessions. The problem is, well, for the shorts, the problem is that these recessions generally don't take big hits like 2000 to 2002 and mm -hmm. 2007 to 2009. So I thought what I would do is just show the audience um, an example of what happens in a when you have a recession okay. and when you have a uh, cyclical bear market within a bull market. So here's the S&P 500 back in 1990. On that long-term monthly chart, it was a little blip on the radar. But here you can see that in three months, the S&P 500 fell from 370 down to about 295 or a little bit more than 20%. And if you think back to what happened at the end of uh, uh, 2018 in the fourth quarter, you can show that uh, next chart, Dave. Yep. It's almost the exact same thing. Uh, everybody was worried because, you know, we're coming out of the, the huge secular bear market and we start talking about recession, trade war, Fed, this, that. And you start thinking because of recency bias that everything is going to just get hit. We're going to be in this long two year drawn out move to the downside. And I just want to point out that's not what happens here. 20 percent correction, a cyclical bear market in three months. And then we go higher. So I think we're going to go higher. I think there's two catalysts to really pay attention to. The first being transports. I know you mentioned it a little bit ago. Yeah. I am watching the transports like a hawk. Those periods of consolidation on the S&P that were circled, you can take a look below. Transports and small caps struggled during those periods. But when those two areas, transports and, and small caps, break out, that's when the S&P 500 generally goes on a big move to the upside. So that's what we're going to kind of, kind of want to keep an eye on. And then also the rotation. So you've got to be looking at the treasury market and okay. the S&P 500. And there you have it. When you see that treasury yield moving higher, like it was in 2017 throughout 2018, that tends to coincide with a big push higher in the S&P 500. So those are some of the things that I'm looking at. I don't know if, how you feel about the, the market going forward, you know, this quarter and then 2020, but I'm pretty bullish. It, it certainly, I mean, you certainly seem to be, and I, you make a compelling case to do so. And I, you know, what I love about this, the historical perspective, it, you know, too often we, 1990 feels like ancient history, but there's some really good lessons in terms of a cyclical bear market, how that fits into the big picture. I'm, you know, I'm curious being, you know, given that you're fairly constructive again with good technical reason for that, what would you see that would tell you that you're wrong? What, what would you see that might cause you to revisit a more bullish uh, a positioning or thesis? Is it a particular, is there a particular chart you'd be looking at or is there a particular level we would break down or a particular signal? Like what, what would you be looking for? Well, to the upside, I'd be nervous if the market breaks out and all of a sudden we see leadership from defensive groups. So, you know, right now it's okay to be led by def defense when you're consolidating or you're pulling back. In fact, that's normal. But if you look back into history, 2007, when the market topped, we actually started seeing money rotating away from some of the aggressive groups and into the defensive to right. lead the last leg of that bull market. That would make me really nervous to the upside. To the downside, I just think the S&P 500 has been in a beautiful channel for 10 years. And I think if the S&P went down back below about 2,600, I'd have to reevaluate. Um, and that may seem like, wow, you're, you're you know, kind of you're kind of calling for both things. I'm not really calling for the market to go back down, but right. have to recognize, you know, what we have out there. We got the trade war. I mean, if all of a sudden we start getting some negative tweets again, we know what can happen. I don't think that that um, a couple hundred points to the downside would squash that 100 year chart that yeah. you had pulled up earlier, but right. that's something we have to be aware of. You know, it's interesting. I remember in particular at the 2007 high, you know, noticing things like Pepsi looking really, really good. And somewhere in the back of my mind thinking this does not feel great that that is one of the best charts out there because it just kept pushing higher. And, and again, that was sort of the end, right? When that was sort of the, the leadership on there. Yeah, um, I, know, I know consumer discretionary, a lot of the consumer stocks, especially the discretionary, the more aggressive groups really took a hit in that last push to the upside, I think they may have topped out on a relative basis back in like 2005, 2006, right. when 
construction topped. And so that could be a warning sign. Tom, as always, when I see someone like you uh, share some charts, I'm humbled at, uh, at how much you know about stock charts and how unequipped I am to use the product as well as you do. So thanks for showing some charts that actually really highlight, uh, you know, the long term perspective on it. Really, really well done. I appreciate it. Hey, I check in uh, to your show quite often, Dave. I think you're doing a great job. I love the final bar. And uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I'm bullish, but uh, hey, I'm, I'm wrong quite a bit, too. We'll just have to wait and see how this plays out. That's fantastic. Tom, thanks again. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Tom Boley. Uh, you can see him on Trading Places with Tom Boley, a uh, longtime stock charts contributor, really savvy analyst. And uh, if I ever am thinking of you know, how stocks relate to earnings and how to think about some of the big earnings releases, I always uh, think of Tom first. So uh, make sure you follow some, uh, some of his work. I want to wrap up the show today with the three in three. This is something we do at the end of every, uh, every show where we try to highlight three charts that if you're not following, I would certainly encourage you to do so. And again, there's so many charts, right? I mean, I, mean, I hope your routine is filled with a lot of really cool visualizations on, on stock charts, helping you break down the long-term trends, break down the, the, the areas of interest to you. Uh, but hopefully this gives you some areas of thought that maybe you have not considered yet. So the first of the three and three today is the dollar cash index, dollar sign USD. A lot of people, if you're looking shorter term, uh, like to look at the UUP, which is the dollar bullish ETF. It's a fair short term read. Absolutely. When you get longer term, it gets a little different because the ETF is a little different from the cash or sort of the, the, the traditional dollar index. But um, so for longer term trends, I like to look at the dollar sign USD. We've looked at this before where you have this sort of uh, down move at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. This was with the, the market uh, sort of bottom here at Christmas Eve. And then you had the, uh, again, the pullback, very similar depth in June. And I drew this on here about a week ago when you started to have this sell off and it was testing the 50 day and look at how we're pretty closely matching these previous pullbacks. So again, we are now in the sort of bull market correction playbook here, right? There's a pullback within an uptrend until it changes that pattern. So I'm very much looking to see if we bottom up and bottom out in this 96.75 to 97 region, if we would do so sort of, you know, reverse at the 200 day, this would feel very similar to previous lows and would suggest to me probably a resumption of a, of a bullish dollar environment. But if that changes, if we start to see breakdowns, if we see breaks to new lows, if we see more uh, distribution and uh, you know, a continued oversold region, that might tell you that conditions are a little different. So at this point, really key juncture there. Second one's the long bond ETF, the TLT. We've looked at this before, and we talked last week about this consolidation pattern. You'd call this a symmetrical triangle or a coil if you're a, a sort of a chart pattern uh, aficionado, but essentially it's this uh, equilibrium uh, where you have a sideways trend, lower highs, higher lows, and uh, with today's sell-off, we've actually broken down through the lower end of that pattern, and traditionally that would suggest further downside. The next key level is 136, which is the low from uh, from September, but overall, the fact that we've resolved this pattern to the downside suggests weakness in bonds. And that's interesting that we're right at this point uh, looking at some of Tom's charts where stocks potentially are more constructive. So it could be illustrating more of a rotation back to, to stocks over bonds, more of a, a risk on environment. Finally, I wanted to highlight uh, up and down volume. This is dollar sign NYUD on uh, stock charts, if you're, if you're not familiar with it. There are a lot of different breadth, breadth measures that I look at. I have a big breadth chart list that I like to go through with some regularity just to see where things are at. What's interesting here is this is a cumulative advanced decline volume. So it's basically saying on an up day, how much up, uh, up volume on downsides, how much down volume, and it's sort of accumulating that volume of advancers and decliners over time. And you can see that we have just hit a new high, uh, you know, going through the previous highs from July and from September. So the market not yet breaking to new highs, but the up down volume, the advanced decliners volume already breaking to new highs. In general, you want to use this as a confirmational tool. So you want to see the price breakout and see if it can, is confirmed by the volume. But what this is interesting now is it's sort of already given you the green light. So again, all else being equal, volume has shown you that it were perfectly constructive. There's been enough upswing on these uh, on these updates to push stocks higher. Now we're just waiting to see the price break out. And that's what, uh, that's what potentially will come through the remainder of the week and beyond. That's the final bar for today on Monday, October 21st, 2019. Thanks so much for joining us. We love to open up the final bar mailbag. A number of you sent in some really thoughtful questions. I appreciate it. Get to us at the final bar at stockcharts.com. You can also see us on Twitter at final bar SCTV. Do me a favor, check out our YouTube channel, Stock Charts TV, and see what we've done historically. For the final bar, this is Dave Keller. Have a good night. 